A little late, but uh, we're going to roll. So, uh, three of us presenting, the, the great illustrious Benny, Simon, and myself. You, some of you may have uh, met me before in my 13 and a half years at, uh, at Citrix, building Zen apps, Zen desktop, receiver on uh, lots of different platforms. So uh, that's coming quite useful for what you're going to be about to see, because uh, really, we, we say the user is king, but this, the subtitle of this is, you know, it's a journey from AppSense 1.0 to AppSense 2.0. And I think, you know, it is going to be interesting for you guys, because hopefully, you know, we're going to meet a lot of your needs in cloud, data, uh, and mobile. Um, so this is the agenda. We're packing in an awful lot. We, uh, we might not get to the end of it, but if we don't, you know, we're going to be around with our live demos and live wireless. Yeah, we'll be here at the end of the session. We'll be at the, uh, the, the booth, and so we'd love to give you some, some close-ups of, of the demos because uh, some of them are probably going to be a little challenging. We don't have any screens down the room, et cetera, <laughs> so you might not be able to, to see all the, uh, the fabulous stuff. So here's the agenda. We're going to go through some kind of current enterprise update. You know, that's the, the current products you, you, you know and love. Benny's going to cover system center integration. Uh, user installed apps is Strata apps. That's available on the AppSense la uh, Labs download page. Going to cover data and data now, what we're doing in that, which is uh, pretty interesting as regards what Brian said earlier this morning. Our brand new acquisition, RapSphere, mobile application management, really, really exciting stuff. Again, fingers crossed, going to try a bit of a live demo on that. Um, uh, then we've got some fun stuff. Uh, our uh, social interaction project. Uh, uh, don't worry, there's nothing illegal about it. Um, and then Project Acorn, and then there's just something at the end. Hopefully, we'll get to it. We've got a, a, a just one more thing, because there'll be some breaking news going over the wire at about uh, or an, an hour or so. So um, let's crack on. Um, this is the AppSense mission. Um, Citrix has a world where people can work and play. Um, we're a bit more serious. You know, it's a, a, you know, We want to enable a world where people can choose how they want to work. And you know, everyone in IT faces that dilemma every day. More BYOD, et cetera. You know, if you don't do it, you're damned. If you do do it, you know, like IBM uh, recently uh, talked about, you know, the absolute hassle of, of dealing with uh, many, many different BYOD devices, and in particular, the, the secur security problems that that brings. Um, from our point of view, you know, we think enterprise consumerization is super important, you know, friction-free user computing is what it's all about. You know, all of us hate having to go through multiple logins, uh, you know, uh, which SSO can solve. You know, there are so many friction points for, uh, you know, that we suffer as kind of technical people um, that we hate. And, you know, for the, we have to solve these challenges for the user, com uh, user community. So our approach is focused on, you know, People-centric computing, you know, the user is king sounds a bit cheesy, but, you know, it, you know if you hold that dear, then, it, you know, you get to the correct solutions. And our particular take on how we solve that is uh, we built this user virtualization platform. Now, I saw this diagram over a year ago before I joined AppSense and I said, you know, you don't have a user virtualization platform. You know, you've got a, you've got a bunch of interesting products that solve problems, but you don't have a platform. And I think now in the nine months since I've been here and the year since Harry Labana has been here, you know, I really do think you know, we've got a, a, a pretty serious platform. And it's still evolving, um, but it's going to those, addressing those new areas that traditionally you know, we only dealt with the Windows 7 desktop and, and XP. Um, so there it is in all its glory. And I think uh, pretty much, if you look at the, the left-hand side of that diagram, um, you probably can't read it too well. Desktop configuration, user rights, personalization permissions. These are pretty much our existing products in the, the, the current user, in, in the current desktop stack. These things are all the new things. Personal applications, where we've got Strata apps in terms of desktop, uh, user-installed apps, and now the Rapsphere mobile, mobile <coughs> apps. Social experience, well, that's going to be the the fun thing Simon will do later, and of course, data. And I think uh, seamless, frictionless access to data is something you know, we all need uh, you know, on our iPads, iPhones, etc. cetera. And uh, you know, hopefully, you'll see what we're uh, doing to solve those problems today. 
This has been the journey for many of you uh, who've used our products, or even if you've used uh, you know, other products. You know, you've, it's been you know, the AppSense journey as well over you know, since 1999. Things like profiles, login times, compliance, you know, all those kind of itsy bitsy but important problems you know, you've all had to solve and you've sort of bought additional tools to uh, you know, a mainline vendor stack. Um, then we really moved into infrastructure op uh, optimization. And I think you know, you've seen a lot of that in things like EM, AM, et cetera. Um, and then, obviously, XP to Windows 7 migration, the desktop transformation, has, has been a really big move. And you know, we've seen our tools adopted you know, in that move to Windows 7, which has taken place alongside VDI. But you know, alongside VDI, there's still a lot of physical laptops and desktops out there. So it's, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And then lastly, clearly, you know, the most important thing from our point of view, the big shift to the, the increase in the number of tablets, BYOD uh, devices uh, in, in the workplace uh, has created a massive opportunity uh, for you to be heroes uh, and for us to actually come up with some, some new solutions. So that's really been, I think, your journey and our journey you know, as AppSense since uh, 1999. And I'm just, just building that out. So um, I'm going to hand over now for an update on the current latest and greatest release to Simon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, very quickly then, um, quick recap. Um, those of you who know me know I've been around for many, many years. And most of my time at Accents, and in fact, most of my day job is spent looking at what we call our enterprise products. They're the products that you know and love. So, if I use names like application manager, performance manager, environment manager, and the management center, they're the ones that really have been around for the last uh, nine to 12 years, depending on the product. They're the ones that people are buying, that people are using today, and rolling out to tens of thousands of users. I just want to give you a very quick update on uh, what came out last month, because we did update that stack, so we did. Uh, update the platform, there was new versions of AM, PM, EM, and the management center that came out. So for those of you that are familiar with the R software, I just thought I'd quickly run through what's changed there. Um, simple, simpler simplification, simpler configuration is the words I'm trying to get out of my mouth. Um, quicker to evaluate our software, quicker to set it up, quicker to standardize. We've been working with our personalization server technology for quite some time now, and a lot of that experience is now being fed into two key areas. Number one, it's going into the product, so in terms of templates out of the box for known good applications. For those of you at the back, that says things like Microsoft Office, Internet Explorer, Adobe, Lotus Notes, for instance. So we're sharing some of that experience with you. We're also putting some of our experiences into something called AppSense Exchange and creating a community um, portal, for instance, at the moment is something that we uh, released again last month and can, can continue to develop. So allowing both ourselves, yourselves as retailers, yourselves as customers, whoever you may be, to actually generate your own IP and in terms of either reuse that for your own benefit or in fact share it with the rest of the community. Something else um, that we've definitely seen an increase in over the last um, 12 to 18 months is something called user rights management, privilege management. Nobody wants to give their users uh, administrator rights anymore, particularly when they're going from Windows XP to Windows 7. One of the things that they're doing is removing admin rights. And as such, user rights management plays a big part in that management of the user. Understanding, however, what applications or tasks a user uh, needs admin rights for was actually a bit of a challenge. So whilst our software was able to elevate and uh, elevate privileges on demand and give admin rights to a user for specific apps and specific tasks, understanding what those applications were and what the user was doing was actually a bit of a shortfall. So user rights discovery is an analysis, auditing, reporting tool that allows you to understand what applications actually need admin rights. 
The importance of self-service. Um, for quite some time, those of you who are familiar with our personalization server technology, we've always said we wanted to remove or move, should I say, uh, profile-related support calls from a level two or a level three down to a level one. When we came up with our web-based support console, that's what we did. We're now taking a shift left even further and actually allowing the user to do their own rollback, for instance, of profiles. They can snapshot their own state, they can actually create base templates to say, this is how I've configured my application, my environment, and I want it to stay like this forever and a day, and I want to be able to roll back to this known good state in the future if something <coughs> was to go, go wrong. This self-service portal really is just a stepping stone in a self-service journey. Um, we've already had requests, for instance, from organizations where they actually Users want to start to configure their own policy, for instance. So users want to create their own drive mappings, create their own printer mappings, for instance, within this console and say, actually, regardless of where I go, I always want these icons, these applications made available to me. So it's taking some of the uh, configuration away from, from IT. And the last one, and perhaps one that I'm not uh, overly proud to admit because it's taken us a while to, to get to, but for those of you that are familiar with our technology, every time we've done an update historically, um, we have, rightly or wrongly, done a full uninstall and a full uh, reinstall, and uh, that has caused, um, you know, because of the, the kernel mode drivers we use actually caused, uh, you know, reboots, uh, for instance, to take place. So I'm pleased to say now that we've actually, uh, we're doing that in a far more friendlier way. Um, from a customer point of view, from a partner point of view, it's been very, very successful. Um, we've had some great feedback. We did a great beta uh, period with uh, Environment Manager 8.3 and the latest version of AM. So um, I just wanted to go through that very quickly just to give you a feel of where we were uh, with the existing technology. With that, I'll hand over to Benny. I think I'm going to stand here and press yeah, the button. Can you press the buttons? That's, that's, that's perfect. Uh, what I want to highlight uh, first is our integration into System Center. And the history behind that is that about a year ago, there was a Microsoft Management Summit in Vegas, and our CEO, Darren Antil, he attended MMS. And I was also there, and after uh, <coughs> attending some of, the, uh, some of the sessions, he came to me and said, we need to integrate in System Center, make it happen. And uh, this is what we did over the last year. So uh, just, uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, so we want to integrate all we have into System Center. Uh, how can you do that? Uh, first of all, let's take a look at what System Center is. And uh, for all of you who have been working with System Center in the past, now it's only one System Center package that you get with System Center 2012. And it's a lot of different components. So we decided that we want to integrate into System Center Configuration Manager, so for the deployment of the software, into Operation Manager, which is there for operating an environment, like monitoring the system, into System Center Orchestrator, which is formerly known as Apollos, which is a workflow management system, and into System Center Service Manager, uh, which allows you to do uh, well self-service. We also integrate into AppV, but this is nothing that I want to cover here because AppV also belongs to the System Center family. It's interesting to learn that as soon as you start integrating into System Center. Okay, next one. So what we did is, as I said, integrating into these four components of uh, System Center, and there are there's information available on our uh, on our website. Uh, plus, you can download the uh, management packs for System uh, Center Operation Manager uh, 2007 and uh, 2012 uh, from my absence. Um, the other things I want to show you briefly in the video. So. Uh, where are the videos? Well, down here. Which one first? This one? No. Go back. I want to see SCOM first. You want to see SCOM first? I want to see SCOM first. No? Next one? No. <laughs> Operation Manager. That was good. Why can't I work this play? Ooh. I wish he was using a PC. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> he is suffering. Whatever. We are suffering with technology today, aren't we? You Mac users. Oh, 
Hold on. Hold on. We have to check. Oh, Who of you is using system set? That board? Come on. I can't believe that. So many of our customers, they said that they are either already using System Center or they're planning to use System Center in the near future. Oh, here we go. Okay, first of all, integration into SCOM, and, uh, which is fairly simple because what we do then is we have all the events that the system can see and we are collecting that in our, um, in our management pack. So what you see here that uh, some of the things are not running properly so now we want to look into uh, the environment, why things are not working, and we find out that obviously our agent is not up and running. So you see here, it's not running or it's not set to automatic uh, on server. So what we can do now, we can start the EM agent, in this case, uh, from the console. So what you see here, there's a way you can start the EM uh, uh, agent directly from the SCOM console. And well, you see the dialog box that pops up, and you see how everything is being started, and uh, the problem is sort of resolved after we have put everything in the queue, then the queue is uh, worked through, and after the queue is worked through, you see one after the other critical errors, how they disappear. <coughs> Two, <coughs> another one, and finally, the last one, and after we have that, we can also take a look at our personalization so that everything is up and running properly. Same thing here. Instead of looking at the agent, we check the personalization server. We go there. The same thing, you see it in the management console and start the personalization server. So you see the idea is making System Center a first class citizen. So allowing System Center to, uh, well, to manage all our components as well. Okay, next one, SCCM, which is Configuration Manager, the deployment. So that is even simpler, because all our products, they are shipped as MSIs. And not only the products, also the configuration files. We can put them into MSI. And MSIs are perfectly suited for being managed through uh, Configuration Manager. So that is a very simple example for how things look like if you integrate this into System Center Configuration Manager. So everyone who ever was using SCCM, uh, that looks very familiar. And uh, you can just use it from, from SCCM. You see here the packages, um, you can see the distribution point, you can see all those settings here. And uh, this is what we did for setting up the demo. That was done in a cloud-based demo. So we are also using that to manage our cloud-based demo environment, so we can use uh, a system center configuration manager in this case to manage all that. And finally, something that we are working on now is an integration into service manager and orchestrator. We have a functionality in our products that allow you to roll back application settings to a previous uh, status, and this is what we do here. Here's a list in, in a service manager, like roll back the application settings you click here and you initiate the rollback <coughs> of your uh, Office applications. In this case, we want to roll back uh, Office, so we go here to Office 2010 and click Office 2010. We go, let's say, to the next and submit. So after a while, all this is kicked off. So the request has been submitted, now the rollback <coughs> starts. But what is happening in the background? In the background, we are using uh, Orchestrator the workflow engine that comes with uh, Microsoft System Center. And this is the visual designer uh, for the uh, workflows. So what we do is we have our own uh, integration packs that represent our products. And we just can drag and drop them into the visual designer uh, workspace and design those workflows uh, and then initiate those workflows from um, Service Manager. So this is the integration that we're working on right now. So in the near future, you will be able to get those integration packs into Orchestrator or download from our website, and then you can just create very complex uh, workflows if you need to, and use all the workflow logic that is behind Orchestrator. Anybody ever worked with Orchestrator? 
uh, when you uh, need to work in large environments, a particular cloud environment, this is going to be a very important uh, tool and product uh, to get all the things organized. So here you see that all these things are going on. In the end, the rollback happened. Good. That was the integration into System Center. The next thing is user-initiated uh, uh, application installation. Huh. The question is, why would you want to use that? Uh, we released the first version of Strata Apps, which allows you to self-install applications in March. And it's the first Absence Labs um, product that we released. And right now it's in the incub incubation phase, which means we want to find out how good this engine is that we're using for isolating the applications from the rest of the operating system. The next one, please. The idea that we have here is we don't want to compete with products like AppV or the like, because AppV requires that you're sequencing applications. That's something that you do in the data center that the IT pros do. So it requires a critical mass. And there's a tipping point where you go below this critical mass and that means that individual users want to install applications that are not important enough, or that are not relevant enough, or not enough in a, in a, in a well, in the sense of the number of uh, people who want to use that, so that you want to allow these uh, people to self-install the applications. So it's a long tail principle, as we call that. And it allows users just to install those applications. We do not care about the management of these applications. Please keep that in mind. Because we have other products that do that perfectly well, like Application Manager and Environment Manager. That works perfectly well with those. Here, we only have the runtime that allows you to self-install the applications for certain use cases. And I just want to show you one of the use cases. If Simon is able to connect my laptop, you, 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 you want to really hold it? I don't particularly know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be interesting. OK. So here is my, if, please just, just I love yeah, it. yeah, that, that, that's perfect. This is uh, one of the laptops that I'm using to, uh, well, also to record those videos that I'm using uh, for Sean and I when we do our protocol comparison sessions. So what it is, it's a Hyper-V box. And on the Hyper-V box, I'm running a VM. So it's a Windows 7 VM. Now, I have uh, uh, some applications running there because I need my, my clean test environment. But I have a set of preferred tools that I want to use. And I just want to turn on the, uh, um, in this case, I want to turn on Strat Apps to provide me these tools as needed so that also when I'm done with my well, with my organizational work behind all the applications that I'm using here for the tests, I want to be able to turn them off again. So now I want to turn on Strat Apps, and you see things are changing on the desktop. So suddenly I have my preferred file manager. I like to use Total Commander a lot more than I like to use Explorer. And I have a license that I bought a couple of years ago and I can use my own license. So there's no, not a licensing problem. I can use that in my corporate environment, but I want to make sure that it does not destroy my corporate environment setup that I have here. And the same is true for InfoView, so for viewing images. Um, but now I want to add something, because I have an, an application, no, not an application, a file that has no file association. So what can I do? I want to read or I want to edit that C++ file. Now, I need to just add an application, and that's what I'm doing now. Like, I could drag and drop in here, but you see there's an integration into the shell. Ah, I just <coughs> click that here. And what you see behind the scenes, now the application has been installed in the Strata Apps bubble. It's going to take a while until the installation process launches. I'm going to close that, select the language, go through the installation process. I agree. Yep, that's where I want it. Maybe I disable that one. Let's say install. Now the standard installation process starts. And you see there's a frame, a green frame around it, that shows that Strat Apps takes care of it. We're done. Finished. 
Okay, the application launches. We're almost done with the installation of the app. Here we go. Now the app is here. And if I double click, example, yeah, all the association has been done. And if I want to turn it on, yeah, after all the work is done, if I just turn it off, and it all goes. Thank you very much. That's it. What I wanted to share with you. Cool. Excellent. Any questions on that? Any questions, while, um, Any questions on that while, while uh, he connects his uh, other PC back to the, net, to, to the projector? <coughs> oh, yep. Far away. Is it supported by operating systems other than Microsoft? Not now. No. Only on Microsoft operating Is it backwards compatible like XP? Ooh, we're working on that. This is why we wanna why we're working on the engine to make the engine as compatible as possible. Sorry, what was the what was the request to work on what operating system? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, for example, uh, XP, XP. Uh, ah. applications working on Windows Seven or Windows Seven applications working on okay. XP. So like cross cross, cross OS. Cross, cross OS versions. Right now it's not, but we're working on that. <laughs> Are you get the demo going? Are going to try and get the demo going? The it's, it's, as it's licensed, okay. it's licensed part of free? Or is it yeah. No, it's individual. You can download it for free. It's available. You can go to our website, you can download it and play around with it. OK. Uh, where are the, uh, so when are you using all those apps, where is that captured? I'm just thinking how that will work in a full VI environment. Oh, that works perfectly well because what we have, it's like in a file system and it's captured here in the part of the file system, but it's completely decoupled from the underlying OS. So it lives in a piece of the file system and you can also uh, install it to a thumb drive. So you can use the thumb drive from one machine to the other, just plug the thumb, thumb drive in and you have the same application set available on another machine. Yes. So it only lives on the file system. As soon as you turn on the Strata Apps Engine, it uses the information from that well, file structure, if you turn it off, well, it ignores it. So if the user logs on to full VEI, how, how does that come down? You would use a, uh, well, uh, a redirected folder? Or yeah, for example. Right. So so today, if you were to go onto Access Labs and download the first iteration that we've released, uh, the store, so the files, the registry that's been virtualized, would have to be on a local drive, okay? So for this particular release, We've removed network support out of it, and we've removed centralized management, so IT management, out of the product. The main reason for that is we want to get app compat. Yeah. At the moment, we've had somewhere in the region of 1,200 downloads. We've seen about 7,000 applications installed, and we've seen just over about 1,000 unique apps. That information is actually being fed back to us via a Microsoft Azure Cloud, and we're able to pull up reports. You can opt out of that, by the way. Um, the next release will then focus on making those applications portable. For the desktop, we really see thumb drives, uh, VHDs, um, uh, you know, perhaps even our own data technology or a Dropbox type technology. In the data center, um, we would definitely be looking either a network drive <laughs> or, for instance, something like a RingCube or a VHD type thing. Right now, I find it very, very convenient if I can just install it into my VMs and then turn it off just in order not to pollute my demo environment. And then after I did the demos, turn them on, and I have all my apps uh, that I typically use back. And this is what I think is very, very convenient. That's my personal use case I'm using it for. Good. OK, let's uh, crack on. And actually, We're still here. Um, when I first joined AppSense, I went through, for whatever reason, four laptops in, a, in about uh, four weeks. So uh, having reinstalled a few apps over and over again, I told the team, you know, we had to get this Strata app stuff out fast. Uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't had a chance to use it again. But uh, that, that laptop refresh case where you've got a bunch of, of, of specific apps that are not covered in the golden image or, 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 or app V package, you know, it's a very, very you know, useful use case, I think. OK, uh, and as a segue, some of the underlying technology um, in Strata Apps, actually, when I looked at it when I joined, I realized would form the underpinning of 
this next product, uh, Data Now. So actually, um, you know, the, the 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 user installed App Store AppSense has been it's actually been going on about four or five years. Actually, it's been going on quite a long time. So lots and lots of technology being developed, and, and now we're you know now we're actually getting it to market. Uh, you know, even though it's via AppSense Labs, so you get to look at it early. But getting it out early means you can tell us what you want, and we can adapt it to your needs from a commercial point of view. So if you haven't looked at it on AppSense Labs, do look at it. It's quite, kind of interesting technology, and there's another release coming out in a month or two. So uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. You know, you've all seen the stats. You know, lots of devices. Um, lots of people need to use them. You all know that. Um, one of the first things we did in data was put out you know, what I thought was a, a bit of a toy, actually. But it was an experiment. It, it was actually our first iPhone and uh, f first iPad app, our first Mac app. And it's very simple. It just does encryption. It's linked into to, to, to data lock and does encryption. You think, well, why do you need that? You know, uh, Dropbox has got 256 uh, AES. Of course, that's at the bit level. And if you look at all the, uh, the, the headlines, you know, it's people's credentials getting compromised, coming straight in. So all that lovely bit level encryption, not really worth anything, actually. So this is really useful if, um, if you're not going to stop your users uh, using Dropbox, then at least get them to download this free utility and at least have all your files um, encrypted. Uh, and it, they, they appear as little ALK files. as a, a Mac client, there's a Windows client. You can download that from, from AppSense Labs. So that was our, our kind of experiment you know, as a, a, a prosumer, uh, a prosumer uh, task that you know, got us onto new platforms and put something out there that um, you know, we've actually got a lot of positive feedback. Um, some companies came back and said immediately, oh, you need to integrate with Box, you need to integrate with ShareFile. And uh, well, that got us thinking. So we'll show you the fruits of that in a, in a second. Um, so you know, what about the enterprise? Um, so from an enterprise point of view, you, know, you guys, we all need performance. Um, you know, we need governance. And, but do we really need to go through you know, old clunky VPNs to get back to our enterprise assets back at base? Um, you know, do we need to disturb our workflow? Or do we want to have, you know, use our, our software in a transparent way uh, when we're working remotely with data? You know, we don't want to move the data from a home drive to a special partition or a special SAN or something like that. That doesn't make sense. And you know, above all, uh, seamless, frictionless access is, is really the key here. Uh, and I actually use uh, Microsoft Offline Files, which is just brilliant in a, in a Windows world. You know, I've kind of used it, it seems, for years. So you know, whenever I drop my laptop, you know, I've always had my files backed up. Uh, but now with the plethora, plethora, I'm not good at these words, I don't know. With these many new devices, um, you know, we need something that's uh, cross-platform uh, and also has very rich uh, and detailed policy governance. Because you know, the kind of situations you use devices now and the kind of control you want um, really needs to be fine-grained. Uh, otherwise, you can't have this you know, perim perimeterless security and, and total free access without, without fine-grained policy. And you know, the best example when I get to on the Rapsphere stuff is you know, can show you how fine grain you know, we can get on policy now, which is pretty amazing. Um, so we've come up with this product called Data Now. Um, anywhere data access with enterprise class governance and control. And really, you know, as I said, uh, it doesn't disturb the workflow, it utilizes you know, your existing data centers. You've got gobs of storage in there. You know where it is. From a, from a governance point of view, it's probably, you know, if you've got physical location governance rules, you know, depending on which area, you know, which vertical you're working in, um, actually having access to your data center uh, data is probably um, a, a very important thing. You don't, and the reason people have used Dropbox and the like is just convenience. It's just they haven't been able to get easily to, to, to the home asset. So, you know, my daughter's got a lockdown laptop. What does she do? She puts. Uh, Unimportant company data, I must stress, um, in Dropbox. You know, nothing that would compromise her job, obviously. Um, but you know, if she had a, a, a lovely solution like Data Now, and if I can sell it to, to M and B, that would be great. Um, then she wouldn't need to use uh, all these uh, different storage uh, providers in the cloud. So, how does it work? Um, so what we do, it's very easy. We drop 
a, a hardened virtual appliance in the DMZ. Um, links into your AD for, for authentication. Um, uh, and that's kind of pretty much it. You, know, you log into it, uh, you get access to your drive. Um, we didn't engineer this, but our CEO, Darren Antill, um, just, we just went live across the company with, with the beta of this. So he dutifully you know, logged in, put his files, you know, connected them all through data now. And the next day, probably had a, a, a hard drive crash in his laptop. So he wasn't using any form of, of backup until he got inadvertent backup through, through data now. So he just sent out uh, this morning, was it this morning or yesterday, you know, a gushy email saying, you know, you saved my life, guys, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I was about to do presentations to banks, et cetera. And he was able to access all that data, you know, on his iPad and his iPhone, et cetera. Didn't miss a beat. Didn't really plan it like that, but it was a, a wonderful endorsement. Um, so we're going to put, and I can show you the connectors we've done on the client side, but we are going to put all these connectors in the back end because uh, having connectors in the back end to lots of other storage data providers means you can switch data providers. You know, you don't have to be held to ransom because you've got lots and lots of data in there. Um, you know, it is a commodity, I think, storage in the cloud. You know, it, most of it all originates from S3 anyway, and then people add their, their premiums. You know, if you want to pay those, that's fine. But we'll give you the flexibility to move around. And I think, you know, we're not a storage provider. You know, we're in, you know, we provide, you know, I think of us as an intelligent data broker. So we can vector your data from anywhere to anywhere and give you uh, the maximum amount of flexibility. Uh, and that obviously includes your data center, because, you know, you know how good that is, because you built it. Um, okay, so we're going to try a demo with the absolutely crappy wireless we've got here. Right. <coughs> right. So we've got 15 really? minutes. We're going to have to go fast. Yeah. You know, no, no, we've got a little bit longer. Have we? Yeah, a bit longer. Oh yeah, we got uh, half an hour. Right. Come on. Wow. This project is absolutely not good either, is it? No, screens halfway back in the room would have been nice as well, but hey, we can't have it. Well, we'll get some money back from Brian. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Or tech target, obviously. So, what I want to do is I'm currently sat uh, on my infamous Mac, which has let me down numerous occasions today. Um, along, he, along the top there, you can see uh, a little man who's running with a briefcase. And that is our data now client for Mac. Um, that is very small um, application. It's uh, in short, you know, ask me where I want to keep my documents locally. It's asked what the uh, address is. It's using HTTPS to communicate back to, back to the appliance. Um, very simply, I'm going to go and open that data now folder. This is probably one of the least exciting demonstrations I've ever done, but you know, we're going to create a text file on a folder and see it replicate across multiple environments. It's very exciting. Um, so, that's sarcasm by the way. Um, I'm going to go <laughs> into well. uh, my documents. I'm going to create a uh, folder. I just want to call that folder Benny. I'm going to move that folder up into my documents and then I might go and create a new text document and I might want to just say things are going okay question mark. Um, I'm going to save that document into my data now folder into that folder that I've just created called Benny and let's just call it feedback I'm going to save that and that is going to save um, that particular document to my local drive in the data now folder and what's going to happen is that's now going to synchronize uh, back with the appliance as you may have guessed and that data this is key that data is actually going to sit in the data center in my home drive. Yeah? It's not sat on an appliance, it's not sat on the cloud, it's sat on my home drive. The data we've already got and we've been using for the last 10 years and we've already, already paid for. What I'm going to do 
is I'm going to go across to my Windows machine where I've got the data now client. And if I now go and open that folder and I go into documents, I've got a folder called Benny, that's good. And I've got one that's called feedback. So let's just go and open that up. Let my as you can see, things are going okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, are they really? Question mark, question mark. And mm. I'm just gonna save back now back again. So uh, again, I'm saving locally and that's now updating that file for me. I'm just going to close down Word and all the small debug. I'm going to go back to my Mac. Now I'm going to go into the web browser. I'm going to access the server directly because I may be on a device that doesn't have the client for instance. So now I'm going to log in. I'm using the last pass here to take care of my username and password. But again, HTTPS connection back to the server. Again, I see my home drive, I go into my documents, I can see Benny, I can go and open that particular file, that file gets downloaded, it's Chrome, and then you can see that that file has taken place. That's all very good. I can do that with Dropbox, how exciting. The key thing is though, as I stated before, if I now go to my Citrix ICA client, which, Preparation is always, would be nice, wouldn't it? I'm just going to connect back in now. I'm going to connect back into my network via a VPN. I'm going to run a Citrix connection. I actually want to give you a, a, a view of my home drive uh, using a Citrix connection. Apologies, this was all set up, but the uh, Wi-Fi died at the start, as you know. Uh, red dots, you shouldn't have red dots. Well, you can tell now how old our Citrix mm. environment is and how long my home drive's been around. Yeah, we had to get rid of those a long time ago. So I'm now going to connect in. Uh, hopefully there's nothing embarrassing on my AppSense desktop. <laughs> there's my AppSense desktop. If I go to the file share, you can see that file share there. You can see my documents. Hopefully you can see a folder called Benny. You probably can't at the back, I apologise. And if I go and open up that document, you'll see that things are going okay, are they really? So let's just do that one more time. So I'm now connected to a server in uh, the tech Silicon Valley that is Warrington. Um, Darsbury, oh, well, we prefer to call it Darsbury. Um, it's where Lewis Carroll was born. You know, that's kind of, kind of elevates the conversation. So I now update my document, just to prove a point. Again, I'm gonna save that. Again, I'm gonna close that down. I can now, drop that Citrix connection. I could come back to my Mac device, give that a little bit of a, uh, give that a little bit of a kick. That now synchronizes my home drive back with my Mac, and with any luck, uh, that has actually been updated uh, from there. So very, very simple stuff, but hopefully I've got lots of nods that it's working, it's using my backend storage, I haven't had to change my workflow, when I go onto my Citrix environment, when I go onto my VDI environment, I don't need the data now technology. I use folder redirection and map as, as I always have. But when I'm on multiple devices and I'm out, I'm out of the road, I've got access back to that data. And that's one of the things, including the policy, that we believe uh, is, is unique. So, what happens... You're going to show them Astra? Yeah, what are these developers doing on the West Coast for us? So uh, what we're going to do... Uh, and, in, and in Darsbury as well. I apologise. I will be watching this video. Other people the guys on the West Coast surf, <laughs> surf all day. Right, so two things here. First of all, if you go into the App Store now, or the Google Store, you'll be able to download the Data Now client um, from either of those stores. And that Data Now client, again, will give you the ability, he says, to access mm -hmm. your home drive, for instance, and access the data now server. Just just one thing, you won't be able to use it unless you've signed up for the beta. Because um, you will have to install the, the virtual appliance. So if I go into, for instance, um, the client now. Sorry? I said in your DMZ with a beta product with full connectivity to your... Where, we're running it. 
we're, we're away. But yeah, it's a good point. Actually, it's a good point. So we are, you know, we have thought about that. So we're having some chats with people um, like Citrix, funnily enough. Uh, how could that thing happen? Um, because uh, the Netscaler SDX, for example, is really good architecture for just plugging a virtual appliance like this in. And of course, you'd be very happy with a, with a Netscaler new DMZ, wouldn't you? Well, there's another reason to get one soon, coming soon. So, uh, you know, there's some nice photos I've got in my home drive. There's a nice one of Keith there. Uh, you know, I think there might even be one of mm. me. I think I need I'm to not, slim down a bit. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, but, you know, this Data Now client is literally just doing a Data Now connection back to my home drive. However, the other thing that Keith spoke about was connectors. And connectors can exist on both the back end server, so on the appliance, and connect to services that IT are delivering, but also on the client. And bear in mind there's policy around this as well. So, what I want to show you is something called Project Astro. And Project Astro gives me the ability to actually have a number or a single application. You'll have to apologize for the slight challenging graphics at the moment. This is very. Uh, early software, um, but Astro actually gives me a single view from an app to both my data now, but also my other providers, for instance. So for instance, if I choose to click on add, I can choose to have an FTP connector. I could ha choose to have a web dab, a SharePoint connector, yeah. which personally I can't wait for because working my way through our SharePoint site is, is painful. Um, and let's hope IT don't watch this video. Um, Let's hope they Box. do. .net, SkyDrive, for instance, ones that I've already connected, for instance, are SkyDrive and ShareFile. You can see that there are some um, early views of, of how we may represent when something is full up. You can see that quotas there, you can see actually, I mean, I only tweeted probably 10 days ago that I cancelled my 50 gig Dropbox and dropped back down to a free. What I didn't know was if you've got 50 gig up there already, they let you keep it. So they just won't synchronize it all back down again. So I'm actually using 42 gig of 4.2 free, which is an interesting statistic. Um, but that's why that is like that. You can see it's red because it's full. Share file, I've got 2.5 out of my seg, um, sorry, out of seven. I've got access, for instance, to photo libraries and local files, for instance. And I've obviously got access to the data now. So if I go into the data now again, I've got this ability to say, okay, Here's my folder called Benny. Here's my document that we were working on. That's brilliant. What happens if I swipe that file, for instance? Well, that gives me now the ability to manage that file. So I can now delete it. I can now favorite it. I can catch it. Very similar if any of you have used Dropbox, for instance. But I've also got the ability to click on my transportation lorry. My transportation lorry allows me to start to copy and move certain files. Now at the moment, I'm going from data now, so I'm trying to take a file out of my home drive, and I'm trying to move it to SkyDrive. This at the moment has got a fixed policy on it, which means I can't actually get to Dropbox. I can't move things out. I can't move a file right. from data now into Dropbox or share file, for instance. However, if I want to cancel that, and I actually go back, and now I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit more, because I'm going to my Dropbox, I go into personal, I'm getting very personal. I go into music, and now you can all see the type of music Mac. that I like, right? Fleetwood Mac. So a bit of Fleetwood Mac in there, but a bit of Girls Aloud, James Blunt, if I want to cry, um, Lionel Richie, Madonna, they're all there. Oh, yeah. um, anyway, I could go back and go into pictures, for instance. I could uh, go and take a picture, see if I can find another picture of Benny somewhere. Um, I think there, there's one there, so that's now going to download. That's a nice one of, nice one of, uh, of Benny there. So I'm just going to swipe that. I'm going to transfer that. So I'm now going to go the other way. I'm going to transfer Daisy from Dropbox into Data Now. So I'm now going to put that into my documents, put that in my Benny folder, and I can choose copy or move at the bottom. I'm just going to say copy, and that file now gets uploaded to my home drive, for instance. And again, various different levels of policy that we can put around that. As you see, I was able to copy one way and not the other. Good, 15.26, we are doing all right. We're rocking. Did that make sense to everybody? Quick question, very quick. Are the data stored on the mobile 
Or? Okay, so um, the data on the mobile devices um, across the board is a view only and download as and when necessary. Uh, you can, for instance, go into, if I just click across there, you can go, for instance, choose what size of cache you want to use. You can choose whether it syncs, for instance, manually, how often it syncs, that type of thing. How long um, the cache lives. How long the cache lives. But obviously, a lot of that then depends on the amount of policy that you've got on it as well. Right. Because you might put a policy on that says, Keith's not allowed to do that. He's not allowed to And connect. some people in, in a corporate environment would freak out with that. And they say, well, if we're going to have connectors, it's got to be on the server side. Because then, you know, we can, we can watch everything that happens. Uh, yeah. Also, we can audit. You know, it's, it's easier all, to it's audit. Of policies that you apply to you. Yeah. Daisy's back on my Mac. That's yes, all good. Right. Remote wipe is so you can already. Connect me when we go back into that. Yep. So we are desperately running out of time. I hope you're finding this of interest. <coughs> Keith's now going to have a very quick conversation about our recent acquisition. You're going to connect, yeah, connect me up there. OK, so going back to that personal application, you saw the desktop uh, UIA Strata Apps piece. Uh, we've now got, with, with a, a new West Coast acquisition, and they live in a kind of converted shop in uh, Redwood City, um, but they're going to move down to our, our Santa Clara office, which nestles in Great America Parkway in the shadow of the, the mighty Citrix campus. Um, so uh, they've got some really, really interesting technology that I want to uh, go through and show you. Um, so, you know, this is, this is the challenge again, you know, not going to spend a, a lot of time on this. Uh, you're all aware of it. You know, I, I think the one at the bottom is, 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 is the real killer, though. You know, Corporate security and compliance is, is, is the real, real killer that causes people you know, to, to go through uh, you know, many, many sleepless nights when the, the CEO says, you know, I need the data on my iPad. You've got to let me have it. I'm the CEO. You know, if you can't do it, I'll just employ somebody else who can. And you know, it is really, really challenging. And clearly, there's some solutions out there. But you know, they're not completely um, ideal from uh, our point of view. And you know, Gartner at the moment you know, thinks that there is no ideal solution, so it must be true. Um, there are, you know, if you actually look at these uh, MDM solutions, you know, they, if I'm bringing in my personal iPad, do I really want something that's going to do a complete wipe of all my uh, lovely pictures, in your case, of, of Donald Duck and Fleetwood Mac songs? Well, actually, yes, I think that would actually be good, a good use of MDM. <laughs> But for me, because I've actually got kind of more important stuff and uh, uh, lots of better songs like Killing Joke, for example, and, and, and more esoteric stuff, then I don't want that to happen. I do want my corporate data and my corporate apps, though, to be controlled. I, I'm good with that. Um, speaking of good, um, you know, that is you know, a, another way to go. But again, you know, you've got bespoke apps. Um, you've got to, if you want to put your applications in their containers, etc., you've got to go through you know, lengthy uh, development process with SDKs, etc. You know, who wants to tie yourself to those kind of uh, constraints? You know, we know the world is moving very quickly. Devices are being refreshed. Now, we've all got a minimum of, of three devices. You know, you're going to refresh that device on average you know, once a year. So tying yourself to a solution that stops you moving quick, not smart, I don't think. So, uh, with RapSphere, as I hopefully show you, you know, it's a, a very, very agile solution. You know, it doesn't need a, an SDK. You can wrap applications dynamically, and you can change policy on the fly, which is uh, the really cool thing. Uh, and it's all built um, on a multi-tenant stack on, on AWS. Um, so there's no on-premise servers or anything. You know, Simon and I called Maurice on the West Coast uh, the other night. It was last night, wasn't it? It seems like two weeks ago. And it was last night and got provisioned you know, on our iPads, you know, just sent a, a simple welcoming email, click on it, you know, we're, in, we're in the system. Uh, and then um, you know, we can start getting provisioned with the app. So let, let's try and see. Oops. Do you want to go on? Oh, let's keep going. All right. Yeah, let's, get, let's keep going. Right, OK, so I'm going to try and show you as user and as admin, because really I like control, so it's, it's not, never great being just the user, is it? Now, let's see if the Wi-Fi has dropped again. No, good Lord. OK, so um, what you see here, and you might not see too clearly, but I've got a set of corporate apps which are wrapped with this little... Uh, unsexy symbol in the corner here. These are my corporate apps 
that have been deployed to me via RapSphere. So I can have a corporate version of Adobe Reader, which can access corporate data, and I can allow other apps to access that data. And it's totally different from my personal, um, my personal app and, and its data, which means that you know, as an admin, you can exert fine-grained control <coughs> over that. And if you go into the RapSphere app, that gives me a, a view of the RapSphere store. So the highlighted apps are the ones I've downloaded. The uh, unhighlighted ones are, you know, are ones I, I can download. So that's the user view. Pretty simple. And you know, if I want to, to, to download an app, I can just hit that. Uh, and I won't do that now because I'm fearful of, 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 uh, of the crappy Wi-Fi. But uh, trust me, it works. And I'm prepared to do that. Uh, I'm prepared to do that over beer. That's a, well, after you've had three beers and you've imagined it, it's all working. Sorry? Are you going to run that? Well, I could run that if you want. Oh, I just put it under pressure. Yeah, run that. It's oh, not right. very exciting. Fair oh, there's an example of a policy somebody's put on. I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> so this has the password of 1111. Highly. Uh, so what I've done is put a policy <coughs> additional on that which says for certain apps, I want you to have, you know, you're going to have to put a pin code in. Okay? And it's fine-grained to the extent of if I, and I'll show you actually, assuming the Wi-Fi is still working, which I cannot believe. Um, this is an example of, 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 of the app policy. This is a default app policy that I happen to know applies to, to Adobe. And you can see, and I can check if the device is rooted. You can't read these things probably. Um, it's got geolocation, allow, disallow by location. Um, and the one that I'm looking at is, where has it gone? Uh, default app policy. There's so many things here. It's got you know, it, a whole set of policies around data, whether I can copy and paste in or out, um, wipe data in memory on, ex on exit, and also do I want to encrypt all data on the device? So I can do that as well. So you know, it's uh, it's pretty funky. There it goes. Authentication. So I can say require auth on foregrounding. So it's a particularly sensitive app like healthcare. I can require, if you move away, then somebody maybe picks up the device and moves back to it and foregrounds the, the app. Again, it needs a pin entry. I think that's a pretty, pretty neat. I like that one. Um, and then I can look at all the devices. Keith Turnbull, what am I doing? This gets pretty interesting. This is good for Germany, Benny, because you know, I know in Germany uh, people are very keen on, on sharing personal information. Oh, yeah. So you can find I out where, 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 where people are. You know where, where they're using their device. You know the state of the state of it. There's basic MDM functionality as well. If you want to be uh, uh, Godzilla and, and blast their device, but you know we 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 put that in. You know for corporately owned devices. You know where you you know you want a very simple. You don't need to go through all this fine grain policy. But my belief is, you know, for most of us bringing our own devices in, you know, this is the only way to go. You know, you, people are going to have to go this route for these devices to to, to coexist. Uh, in, in the corporate environment and, uh, and meet governance restrictions, etc. So, anything else I want to show? Not really. Um, there's all the apps. If you go into the app, you can go and see what policy is applied to the app. And you've got, you know, a set of policies. There's a HIPAA policy set, obviously, for, for US healthcare, PCI policy, etc. So, you can just do a whole lot of predetermined policies. So, you can see really, really fine-grained and really actually what you need, you know, as opposed to a PowerPoint telling you about policy, you know, this is the real deal. So the good thing is we're going to be able to, to merge some of this fine-grained policy and accelerate what we're doing on Data Now as well because uh, it applies exactly to, to, to the Data Now product. So I think that was pretty much it, do you? Good. I think pretty good. good. We're running out of time. We're running out of time, so we're going to go fast. I'm going to chuck my VP off the stage, which is never a good thing, I apologise. Right. Oh, 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 all over the place. Right. So, um, oh we've, God, yeah, we are we've spoken that someone's calling saying, get him off stage. Um, don't you busy. Um, right. We've spoken about application manager, environment manager, performance manager. These are the products we do today. We've highlighted what data means to the user. Then he's highlighted what Strata apps means to the user. The other thing that our R&D teams have been doing recently is looking at other ways uh, in, or other things that may be important to the user moving forward. And one of our beliefs 
um, and with all three of us privileged to sit in the office of the CTO, one of our beliefs is that the number of devices increases, the number of apps we receive and use increases, and where they come from, the way in which we work, the way we interact might start to evolve. And uh, there's obviously lots going on with Twitter at the moment. There's various ways we've shown you today of sharing data between cloud-based services and internal ones. But one of the things that we want to show you today is something we call internally the flick it. Okay, so it's got two Fs, flick it. So straight from R and D. Again, I can't apologise enough. All the way from these, Warrington for these uh, for these for these screens, and uh, and you can't see them. I apologise at the back. Um, straight from R and D sits on an Azure cloud-based system. Allows me to do a couple of things. Allows me to share information between me and my devices. And the next step to share information between me and anybody that decides to subscribe to me. Multiple platform. Um, the demo I've got today is a bit clunky. That some of the uh, iOS apps aren't quite there yet. The notification systems aren't in place. But what I would love you to do, if you want to take part and you don't mind the time, is I would like you to go onto your devices. I'd like, if possible, I really would like some people to do this. Particularly if you've got a phone or an iPad. Go into your device, go into Safari, enable cookies, and go to http flickit.cloudapp.net. Have I got anybody in the room that wants to volunteer quickly? Quick show of hands, at least one there, good. Anybody else? Two, lovely. It'll be worth your while, I can promise you. <laughs> yeah. Worth at least a beer. At least a beer. At least a beer. At least a beer. Right. Let's get this done. So, anyone copying that address down right now? Have you got it? Does anyone else, anyone else still need it? God, still need it? Very lethargic, this lot, aren't they? Come on. Yeah. Beers to be having a In the US, they'd all be there, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, http colon forward slash forward slash flickit.cloudapp.net, <coughs> okay? The username needs to be SRT demo in caps. And the password is AppSense, capital A, capital S. All right? So I'm just going to flip over now while I'm doing that. So I'm going to sign in. And any of you can do this. So you just go to the website address, SRT demo, password, AppSense with a capital A and a capital S. And I'm just going to sign in. And as you can see, I'm signed in. Now I'm signed in to an <coughs> online notification system. What you can see here, on my flicks, okay? Now these flicks could exist on the Android or the iOS in your notification system. Just so happens I'm just showing it through a web browser and I'm allowing you to participate if you would like. So um, what I'm gonna do is cancel out of that and on my device I'm going to go to the Cricket website. I'm just going to go to, first of all, I'm going to go to Google Maps. Is anyone logged in, by the way? Yeah, I think I'm in. Okay. If you're in, there's a little button at the top or on the side that says Auto Open Next Flick. So I'm going to need some of you to keep an eye on this, right? So here's my screen here. I'm just going to go to Google Maps. There's no ladies in the room, so I can't ask anybody's address. So I'm going to have to make one up. So I'm going to go from Daresbury to my old house address because I don't want anyone stalking me. And I'm going to get some directions. So I've got some directions I'm going from our office in Warrington down to Wokingham. It's effectively our northern office down to our southern one. And um, that information that's on my PC. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to flip that content to all of you or to my devices, for instance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say flick it. And I'm going to say flick it. That then sends that flick, and what you'll see, hopefully, on my iPad, no, because I didn't press that button, let's just do that again. Flick it, I'm going to flick it, and as I change over, what you'll see is that it automatically loads up the app, uh, automatically gets that content mm -hmm. and opens up, the, opens up the map. Does that make sense? 
Does that two. work on your machine? Two work? Work? Excellent. Good. Perfect. Thank you. So, the other thing, two I'd, like, the other thing I'd, like, the other, I'd really like your, your help now. I'd like to go back to that uh, safari, back to, um, back to your, um, <coughs> word I'm looking for, back to your web browser, so you're on this, this look again. Make sure auto flip is, auto open next flip is enabled. And what I'm going to do is, from here, I'm going to go on to www.appsense.com. Dangerous. You mean uh, watching Steve Coogan videos? I actually highlight this telephone number, and now I say flick it, call. What I want to do is I want to flick the telephone number, and again, it's going to appear on my device. It's not going to fail on here, unfortunately, because I don't have a phone. But you can see that the telephone number is at the top there. On that device that was waiting, it should have automatically come said, would you like to call this? Would you like to call this number? It came up. So, yeah. yes, it did. Just, a, just, just two very quick ways in which we can share data. We've got Android clients that can take photos and you can flick instantly, for instance. It becomes very, very useful when I want to take screenshots, for instance, on my iPad today. <coughs> I just want to flick it across to my laptop. Um, a number of different possibilities, but just something I wanted, we wanted to uh, share with you. The last thing um, I would like to talk about is uh, it's something called Project Acorn. Okay. Now, lots and lots of people have come to us and said, we love your application management, we love your environment management products, but these things are becoming more and more relevant in the workplace, and we'd love to do to manage the user on a Mac. So, just as an example, and really for those of you that are familiar with. Uh, AppSense environment manager, as it is today, you'll know that we can do things like log on, in session, connect, disconnect, based on location, for instance. This is a very basic, um, very early preview, uh, probably only the second time we've shown it externally, early preview of um, a UV client for, for Mac. Um, so at the moment, what I want to do is I want to go into, for instance, my printers, and I want to see if I've got any printers. No, I haven't. I want to go into Finder, and I want to see if I've got any connections back to <coughs> APWFS01. So I've got no network drive back to HQ, for instance. No network drive back to, to my home drive. And all I'm going to do is I've got the ability, for instance, to come here and say, right, you know, um, when, for instance, I log on, when I log off, when I sleep the machine, when I launch an application, I want to do something. I want to map a drive, I want to map a, create a shortcut, for instance. I might want to do it based on a location. I might want to set up printers. So, for instance, I might want to map a printer called My Home Printer when I launch Microsoft Excel. I might want to unmap that printer when I terminate Microsoft Excel. I might want to change the wallpaper. So, a number of things we can do. Any of you that have seen Environment Manager before will know that this is all common stuff that we can do in a Windows uh, base world. I admit the demonstration isn't overly exciting, but just to give you a feel, if I go and run calculator, I change my wallpaper to a lovely Rye Forum 2012 with Big Ben wallpaper. Notice I've only got two folders on my desktop at the moment. So as I decide to close calculator, I then put that wallpaper back to what it was, but at the same time, add two items on my desktop. So I'm starting to manage the user, starting to manage the environment. Again, I can delete those, I can go and run out, try forum is back, lovely, I quite like that wallpaper. <coughs> and it comes back again, hey presto. If I now go and run, for instance, Microsoft Word, that will now, before, as a process started action, that will now map drives based on Word starting. <coughs> Take a while because of the wireless, but we won't talk about that. And when I start into, uh, sorry, Excel, you'll hopefully see, you can, oh, come on, right there. Things were going so well, weren't they? Let me shift that all the way around. Perhaps it's busy still mapping this. Oh, there we go, there we go. Sorry, it's still busy mapping the drive. Proves that it's not multi-threaded yet, Keith. You need to sort that, <laughs> need to sort that one out. Yeah, Keith, that's um, all fault. 
<laughs> so now I have APWAFS. I have a map drive based on word starting. Apologies, Christ, this is confusing. Um, I've got a printer mapped based on Excel. Again, if I go to Excel and decide to close Excel, that printer disappears because I unmap it on process stop. And I've got that drive map based on Word. So just a very quick uh, example of what was going on there. Does that make some sense? Good. My apologies for the rush. We're in into your thing. You've got two minutes, ladies. We've got two minutes. OK. So just gone over the wire. Uh, just one more thing. Um, some of you may uh, know of Kieran Kamati. He is uh, founder and CEO of a new company called Collage, probably uh, wider known as the founder of RingCube that uh, Citrix uh, bought last year. He, uh, we, AppSense today, have uh, announced a strategic investment in Collage. It's a stealth company at the moment. And uh, so all we're saying at the moment is it's, you know, it's a rich data startup. There's a bit more, there's a bit more wordage in the, uh, the, the press release. But you know, he's an awfully smart guy. He's a great guy. And he's going to move in with his team into our Santa Clara office and be an entrepreneur in residence. So uh, basically what we've done, I went down the road and visited my old chum, Martin Dersmer, at the Citrix Startup Accelerator. Now, we can't afford a big building like Citrix, but we can afford a room. So um, what we've got, you know, we made a, a, a fantastic pitch to these guys. You know, would you want to come into a room in AppSense or, or, or go into a you know, big floor in, in Citrix? And, you know, we won them over with our homespun charms, etc. So, you know, we're really excited about that. That's uh, going to, uh, I think, kick us on in terms of other things that uh, he will drive us to potentially acquire. So you'll see more new things coming out of AppSense Labs. So that's all we've got time for. I'm sorry it's so rushed. We don't have much time for questions. Please see us afterwards in the break or come to the, uh, the booth. As you see, we sort of take you on a journey from what you thought was AppSense to the new AppSense 2.0. And as you can see, you can actually shape a lot of it. If you've got ideas you know, about where we could go with some of these things, please let us know. It's really super important. All right? Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.